Hey everyone, it's Barb Egan with Therapy Talks and Switch Research on today's live. I'm so excited on it when we saw the topic come in. So three practical tips to deal with depression. I got really excited, which is kind of funny when you think about depression, because one, most of us experience some depressive symptoms or at its root sadness. Um, but big symptoms or what we think about depression is usually, you know, black, like my shirt, even I even dressed for the part today, um, but fatigue, like feeling really lethargic and tired, unmotivated, so sleepy, even if you're oversleeping or changes in sleep, changes in appetite, overeating, not eating, that sort of thing. So a really big lack of energy. So it's kind of ironic that I would be really excited about this, but why I'm so excited about it is because as a registered clinical counselor, as a director of a clinic, as a clinical supervisor, anxiety and depression are really such main things that we, we see and we work in. And so I love working in this. I know what it's like to feel this way. I think it's a common human experience to some extent. And so I'm really excited to talk about some practical tips, because if you guys have listened to any of the podcasts with me or the lives, I'm all about the practical. If it can't fit into your real life or in real life, it's it might be um, a psychological theory like this cognitive behavioral therapy therapy, CBT that we talk a lot about, solution-focused therapy, you know, acceptance and commitment therapy, uh, you know, all sorts of different types of therapeutic approaches, which are great. They're evidence-based and we're all about that here. But if it doesn't fit into your real life, like the three practical tips, then, you know, it's kind of, ah, oh, what about me? And again, with depression, often you feel very isolated, very lonely. So in today's live, we're going to talk about three practical tips on dealing with depression. So before we kind of jump into that and unpack some of those, I just want to welcome everyone. And I see so many people on today, which is so exciting because like I said, this is a really hot topic. Most people experience it. And I think even if you're not experiencing some sort of depression symptom or depressive episode, sadness, any of that, um, lack of motivation, hopelessness. Those are big, some common things like just withdrawing from people or activities that you used to love or enjoy. Well, even if you're not in that season or that space right now, maybe your friend is, maybe your family member is, maybe someone you love is, maybe a colleague, maybe someone you don't even know. But again, if you have some tools in your toolbox, then you get to figure out how to best support them. And I think that's really important because most of us experience something like this. So welcome. And I would just love to hear just some of your tips right now. Like what are some of the things that you have tried, whether they work or they don't. So anything's welcome here and there's no right or wrong answer because it's so personal, but what have you tried to deal with depression so far? I would love to hear what are some things you have tried to deal with depression or maybe not even you, maybe it was a friend or a family member or someone that you, or just something that you think of. Because my guess is as you write in the chat box or take some time to think and reflect, is that you might have some tools in your toolbox that you might not even think of or that have been overlooked. And so that's where I want to start. And I really want to encourage you. And Ooh, meditation, Kelly says, Sarah, sleeping. Yes. Oh, working out is another one. Yes. Amy therapy. Yes. Listening to music. 
Oh, these are good ones. Exercise, Betsy says. Oh, a morning routine. Yes, there's something about a routine that really makes us feel in control, accomplished, motivated, hopeful, like we're progressing towards something. So again, those earlier symptoms of depression that I mentioned of, you know, lack of motivation, hopelessness, isolation, um, withdrawing from activities or people that you enjoy. If you have a routine and you're kind of consistent in it, the hardest part is starting that routine, which again, someone else said therapy, that might be really helpful to just hold you accountable, encourage you, figure out what's realistic. That's often a big one is, you know, what used to be realistic to me in this season of life or five years ago, may not be realistic in my life right now. Like I'm a mom of little kids. So a, a lot of these exercise, I am a huge proponent of exercise. If you know my background, like former pro athlete and coach, like I come from a really athletic world. My world now looks very, very different. And so exercise has to fit into it. And again, I'm all about the practical, about really feel, uh, fitting it into your real life. It may not look like um, a crazy gym workout. In fact, I haven't been to a gym in like five years. <laughs> it may look like running with a stroller or I have 20 minutes here to move my body. And even that type of changing my language of moving my body, or I have to work out like that harsh language to move my body, take care of my body can be really healing. And we'll get to that too, just even the word choices. But if you've listened to me speak at all, I'm all about not only the self-talk, but the self-tone and the word choices we use. Um, Claudia, walking in nature and taking things one at a time. Yes, there's something literally so grounding about being in nature. And for each one of us, it's a little bit different. Like maybe it's a sunny day. Maybe it's a walk in the woods. Maybe it's a beach. Maybe it's the mountains. And it, there's just something literally so grounding to our spirit and our body that calms the mind too. That's beautiful. And just smiling, even if I don't feel like it totally, like if I start to smile, it kind of tricks my brain into producing some of these happy hormones. And that's a thing that we can talk on later is just some of these hormones. I call them dose D O S E. They stand for different chemicals in the brain that are produced. But even if you look that up, like D for dopamine, a dose of happiness, I call it. So D for dopamine O for oxytocin. S for serotonin and E for endorphin. So a dose of happiness. And you can look those up if you're kind of like a brain science or like that kind of stuff um, and what, what that does. But even walking in nature or sleeping or exercise or journaling, they produce different um, hormones in our brain. And that's why those things work. Another one, Melinda, being in nature. Yes. Well, I'm on the West coast. So I feel like that's such a prominent answer. And I grew up in the Midwest of the United States, uh, which is beautiful in its own way, but it's very like farmland and cornfields. And it's, it's different when you're in forest and wilderness and mountains of the West coast. Um, so I love nature wherever I'm at for sure. Oh, Gabby, writing things down and seeing if I'm in the power to change anything, comparing what's in my control and what isn't. Well, boom, like mic drop. That is so good, Gabby. And I, I so agree. And I think it's really powerful in writing it out, which is actually why I really like the chat box too. In these types of things, whether you're live with us or recording, you get to go back and read. And some of us learn better visually, like we see it or we actively write it out or type it out. I'm old fashioned. I like to write on paper. And for me, it just really helps my brain conceptualize it. So writing it down, getting it out of up here onto a piece of paper, you can sometimes just change your perspective by doing that. But then Gabby went on to say, if I'm in the power to change anything, like that's taking a stance. That's not a victim mentality of, oh, I just don't feel like it, or I'm too tired. I know I should. And that type of language, but taking some power back, like what can I change? What's in my control? And honestly, I have so many pages in my journal notebook that I write what's in my control. And what is not, what is mine? What is not? And we talked about boundaries last time. And that kind of goes back to it too. Like what is mine to carry right here? Um, what is in my control? That was beautiful. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. So we have some homework, everybody, <laughs> um, some exercise to do um, for this week. All right. And, oh, 
Yes. Kelly says helping someone else camaraderie. This is such a good one. And I think it's often overlooked because when I get, when I get in that space or that spiral, that negative spiral where you just like feel really damp and heavy. And I often ask people when they come into my office or, you know, we're working online together of, Hey, where do you feel it in your body? Often our body tries to tell us something's up before our brain clues in. And it's like this deep heaviness. I had a beautiful young girl in my office, even just earlier today. And I asked her, you know, where do you feel that? And she was, it was so impactful to her. She started to tear up and when pointed to her chest. And that's often where we describe it is like, oh, if I were to describe it, it's really hot or it's red or it's spiky, it's heavy, it's on my chest, it's really weighing on me. And it was such a good way for her to conceptualize it, to separate it from herself. So it's not, you know, defining herself and it's so beautiful. And I often like to think that way because again, our body is trying to tell us too, it's hardwired into our system, but then getting our eyes off of ourselves, out of our own head, you know, identify it in your body, take a few deep breaths. Someone else said meditate earlier. (sighs) Maybe then you can get in that headspace to actually write it down. Maybe you can't go there right away to write things down. Like you can't even make sense. Like you're, you have to tune into your body first for some of us. And then we can go cognitive to our head of what am I thinking? And then we can go to that behavior part too. Like Kelly had said of helping someone else, like to get out of our own head is so powerful. Get our eyes off of ourself onto someone else. And I think, you know, our scars become our most important parts of us because they tell a survival story that we get to share with other people and no one can take our story from us. And in fact, us just showing up is really inspirational for other people to keep going of, wow, that person got through it. Hey, what worked for you? And as you're seeing, and I still have a lot more to even touch on, like you guys are amazing. You're sharing so many great strategies and tips, but they're all a little different. Like what works for you may work different for me or for somebody else. And I love that. I love the power of this because you really do learn in real life what, what that can look like. So thank you everyone for, for sharing that. Um, let's see, Deborah says, trying to use a planner to have something on each day. Yes. Oh, I love that. That's kind of back to that routine, but also that theme of feeling accomplished, a purpose. Cause often when we're feeling depressed or really low, heavy, sad, we kind of lack purpose. Like what's the point? Why even get out of bed? Um, why even exercise? Why go see those people? They don't want to see me anyway. You know, why should I even apply to this job? I probably won't get it anyway. So it's a lot of this negative, um, self-critical talk that we talk a lot about that can feel depression, but to have something planned, again, you're taking power back. You're putting your stamp on it of today. My goal is just to shower is to, uh, go to this grocery store, grocery store for another day for the Friday of this week. It's to try and see one friend, um, something like that, that can be really powerful to have something on the docket. And as you can see those examples, they don't have to be big things like an outing or exercise. They could be a shower. They could be, you know what, I'm just going to sit with my, with myself and have some tea for 10 minutes. And that might feel really uncomfortable at times of just sitting with ourselves, but it can be very grounding. And if we can't be present with ourselves, how can we be present with other people? And I think just giving yourself permission to just be in a culture that says be doing is really powerful. So thank you for sharing that. That's a great one. Um, Oh, I like this name, Yogi Zebra. I like it. Um, Hiking, spending time outside. Yes, that's so beautiful. Moving your body, like recalibrating your body. And then also just being in nature. It's so, so beautiful. So grounding to our system. Ooh, Gabby walking my dog. Yes, I'm such a dog person. So I love animals. It's pretty neat even in our, so I'm a clinical supervisor for about 10 graduate students and licensed therapists. But for my graduate students, we have a really intensive program um, and we take them at different specialists to kind of see, you know, different models of therapy, different modalities from narrative therapy. And I teach on cognitive behavioral therapy to equine therapy for trauma. And we really teach on these mirror neurons in animals that help us calm down. And I'm such a fan of animals. We use horses, we use um, dogs. um, Some people are cat people, you know, that sort of thing. I just think that's really powerful to have that unconditional love, like non-judgmental support of an animal. Really awesome. Love that. 
I have a big Burmese mountain dog. So I'm a, I love dogs. Um, oh, seeing my friends can't help but laugh when I'm around them. Yes. And it's so true. Like friends and laughter. Sometimes I just encourage people when they're just feeling like stuck, burnt out, sad, overwhelmed to laugh, like go on YouTube, find a funny, you know, show or clips that you like. Um, even just this weekend, like I did it because I was like, oh, I just feel like kind of in a funk. I can almost sense myself about to spiral. And so we put on family feud, like Steve Harvey, and it was just like funny um, compilations of family feud. It was so funny. And it, it was just felt so good to laugh. Like you just release so many good hormones. And there's a lot of emotion that I think is released when we can really laugh love that. And when you're with people, I did it with my husband. So we, we got that like a uh, social support time too, which is really good. Um, oh, riding my horse. Yes. Sarah, look at those mirror neurons working. <laughs> oh, great. And more people are joining. This is awesome. Welcome. Welcome. Um, oh, Shelby says deep breathing, reframing and visualization. Oh, that's beautiful. Yes. Just that deep breath. Like there's so many things out there and breathing is one I want to encourage all of you on your expert breathers. Like you've been doing it your whole life, like for decades, probably it's can be done anywhere. It's free. You can do some deep breaths and no one knows that you're feeling overwhelmed or down. Um, oftentimes, you know, again, someone was in my office earlier today and was just saying, I'm sorry for sighing so much. And I was like, I welcome that. That is so good. You're releasing so much. And it's, you know, kind of that old saying better out than in, but in the therapeutic world and emotion world, it's so good to just, and it's like this beautiful involuntary response. Pay attention. If you do that, it's a beautiful release. Um, but those deep breaths, like even if it, if you like to count, count to four, like one, two, three, four, and hold it one, two, and then exhale for four, three, two, one. And that can be beautiful. If you're someone who likes to count, if that trips you up too much, I incorporate visualization often with breathing. So I, I invite people, if they like to close their eyes, you can either put your hand on that pinpoint of your chest. Like maybe that's where you feel really heavy or on your abdomen, on your belly button. And just both those spots can be really soothing if that feels good for you, but you don't have to. And to just inhale really, really big. Feel the diaphragm, like your ribs lift, hit that peak and then exhale melt into your chair and just release anything you're holding. And again, inhale and release. And then we can add a little breathing or a visualization to that of think of a flower, like you're just smelling in a flower. It's really beautiful. Fill your lungs and then blow it like a wisher. <sighs> Disperse, that can be really nice. So there's lots of ways to breathe and it could just be like this too of a, <sighs> it can just be one or two deep breaths, but it, it can be enough to, again, produce some things in our brain, some really good chemicals, and then you know, to reframe. And that can be beautiful too. Cause sometimes if we go right to the cognitive part of, oh, challenge this negative thought, we just can't get there because our body's too heightened. So we have to calm down. So I really like the breathing part. I like the visualization. I like the meditation part too. The walk, like just getting it around music, like someone else had just said too. Um, music has this beautiful ability for our emotions to connect with the lyrics or the melody when words just fail. It's like, we all have those go-to sad playlists or those anger playlists or, you know, exercise playlists where I encourage people like, you know, if there's a song that really speaks to you, go out on a walk or a jog and then speed up during the chorus. It doesn't have to be long. It can be, you know, 20 seconds, but it's like your muscles, your brain, they're all recalibrating. They're all just going in sync with that. And there's so much that can be let out 
or just if you like to listen, like wherever you like to listen, it's amazing what music can do. I really love that. I have a really good friend who just is a music therapist and it's, it's amazing <clears throat> the different parts of the brain that highlight on certain music. Um, there's research that showed like it's almost the same as psychedelics and using that to highlight areas of trauma, really fascinating stuff. So love that. Great, great suggestions, everybody. Talking, yes, Shelby, so good. So talk therapy, psychotherapy, talking with a friend or a family member, yourself um, in the shower or a voice memo, a voice journal, something like that, that can be so helpful. Um, I read once that three out of four of us are verbal processors. So that means that three out of four of us actually need to talk about it to kind of get our ah, aha moments. That's what I'm really feeling need to process through it. So that means that one out of four of us is an internal processor. And so this journal article said, uh, it was a research medical journal that it was more likely men to be internal processors and women more external or verbal processors. And it was so amazing because even if you don't come to a solution as you're talking about it, you often do, but even if you don't, again, back to those dose of happy chemicals, the, those chemicals in the brain are produced to actually feel happiness or endorphins. And like, you're moving towards something. Cause again, with depression, we feel really no lack of motivation, um, hopeless, lethargic fatigue. So even just by talking about it, even though it might take extra energy, we're a little bit farther along if we do it with the right people. And again, mirror neurons too, we co-regulate as humans. Oh, we feel a little more accomplished. So don't underestimate the power of talking. Even if you don't get to a solution, things are going on in your brain that are invisible, that are really good. Awesome. Um, reading about anxiety, trauma, and other topics I'm struggling with. Yes. Knowledge is power. And I think when you have good articles or good, you know, resources, these can be social media. These could be YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, uh, books, podcasts, audiobooks, any of these that you feel like, ah, oh, I'm not alone. Again, I'm not alone. We often feel like we're alone. And so when we can gain just one thing, I encourage people if they're doing a lot of research on their own and reading about it, not to necessarily dwell in it, but ask yourself, what's one takeaway? What's one thing I can try to implement? Again, I'm all about the real life. So if it's okay, this practical strategy with uh, depression, maybe the one thing that we're talking about right now, of uh, you heard a lot of outside and you're like, okay, in my real life. I don't have a ton of time with work and my responsibilities to be outside, but I know twice a week at three o'clock, I can go for a half an hour walk or at lunchtime on my lunch break. I'm going to try to go twice a week for a walk outside or just sit outside and eat my lunch, something like that. That is how you could take one of these strategies, modify it to fit your world. Again, it could be exercise at that lunch break, but it could just be sitting outside and getting some sun and just a change of scenery to try some of these strategies. And therapy can be a great way to, you know, work with your therapist to say, what do you think? What are some, uh, you know, strategies that we could implement and tweak it, but you could do that on your own. You could do that with friends, family, that sort of thing too. Um, and that's why I love this because there's so many different really good suggestions and tips. So thank you. Oh, good. Okay. So Naveed writes, how do you help a loved one suffering from depression without falling into a rescue type of role that can be so hard? And I think even back to our boundary talk last time is if to model how you want to be treated, like to model some of these things. So if you're a parent and your child's struggling with depression or your teen, uh, your spouse, your friend, your colleague, um, just anyone you care about, the best thing that you can do is just be you. Like you're the only one that's handpicked to be in their life right now. And you probably have a really unique role to speak into that. And that's speaking, you know, verbally of encouragement and you matter. Um, often people with depression feel really like a burden. I mean, anybody at times with any distress, anxiety, trauma, overwhelm, uh, we feel like a burden. So it, that's usually a hindrance of, I don't want to burden you and just reassuring them. Hey, I'm, I, I'm so honored that you feel safe to share this with me. I want to hold space for you. I want to walk 
with you through this, that can be really powerful. So just things like that of reassuring, Hey, I'm with you in this. I'm not going anywhere. I can hold this. And so that validation, number one, validate, 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 but also two, so we don't enable is to really model that healthy lifestyle. And it can come to a point, and this is back to the boundary talk of last week, but Hey, the most loving thing I can do is suggest that you, you know, talk to a counselor and I've been seeing when it's been really helpful. So then you're getting on that level of vulnerability, but you're sharing how not to stay there in that dwelling space to actually, again, move forward, even baby steps at a time, or, Hey, I'm going to go for a walk. Would you like to come with me? And that other person who's feeling pretty low might say no a bunch of times, nine times until that 10th time finally says yes. And so be patient, take really good care of yourself so you can show up, not into rescuer mode, but again, modeling, you know, some healthy behaviors, empty cups cannot pour. Empty cups cannot pour. So making sure that you're getting poured into, that you're doing things good for you so that you can model that, but also know to, because if, if you're caring for yourself well in those areas, you're going to be able to, you're just more in tune with yourself too. Like you're kind of more in that rhythm. You're going to notice if something's off or if you're slipping into rescuer mode or anything like that. And so chances are, if you slip into rescuer mode, maybe some other things are neglected in your own life or your own sphere, self-care, mental, emotional well-being. And so taking care of yourself can be really good and modeling that to them. That's a great point because oftentimes that's, that's a big hang up that people feel whether they're experiencing depression or you're supporting someone with depression, it can be really draining and lonely and heavy and you love them. You want to walk with them, but you have to take care of yourself too. And so, you know, some of those practical tips, I would say, you know, what we often think of with depression um, or anything, but three practical tips for depression, I think you can add any of these that you all shared, but it's often therapy and it's often sometimes medication, not everybody. And I'll tell you my view of medication. It often gets a stigma or, um, you know, maybe not the, I don't think it necessarily has to be for everyone nor forever, nor the go-to. I think sometimes we're over-medicated and it actually doesn't help people. So my view of it is kind of like a step stool. If you're trying all the strategies, you know, you're watching it. We are what we eat too. Like our guts are second brain. Like, are we eating well? Are we getting sleep? Are we trying to be with social support and people? What does that look like? The social component is so, so big. Um, family life, friend life, work life, balance, satisfaction, all of these things we have to take in considerations, very holistic approach, um, to see your whole life. And you're trying these, you're in therapy, you're trying these strategies and it's still not working. You're like, ah, I'm doing all the right things, but I'm still stuck. Well, then I think let's definitely explore medication. Let's have, I work with so many GPs cause I don't think it's, it's fair to let you just go through that alone. It's very overwhelming. So I love to just consult if people want to like work as a team approach. Again, I come from sports. So I like that team approach. I'm just saying, okay, this is what I'm seeing. Okay. You're prescribing this medication. This is, you know, from my knowledge of therapy and psychology, these are the side effects that I see. This is what I'm seeing or no, this looks good. And we work together because Honestly, the side effects are often the worst part. Some people experience them, some don't, but being able to utilize that. And so medication can be like a step stool. You're trying, you're in this deep, dark hole and I'm the therapist. I'm I'm reaching down. I'm trying to coach you how to climb out of that ladder. And you're, you're trying to reach for that ladder and you just can't do it. The ladder represents all those strategies of different sleeping and social support and eating well. And then those more specific, maybe cognitive behavioral therapy strategies, cognitive meditation, all these other strategies that you listed earlier, you know, being outside, walking my dog, journaling, all of that. And you just can't reach the ladder. Well, you need a step stool and that can be medication. It doesn't have to be forever. Maybe it's for a season, maybe it's long-term, but that step stool helps you reach the ladder. And then you still get to take credit for climbing out of it. You still have to put in the work. It just, now you can reach them. And so that's kind of my view of medication, like a step stool. And I think it's very valuable, but you don't have to bring a step stool to every ladder that you go to. Sometimes you can reach them. And so it's really unique to each, every person and situation. 
Um, so therapy, medication, I'll say for therapy, when most people think of therapy for anxiety or depression, they think of cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT. And so to learn more about that, we could do a whole talk on that. It's such a fantastic one. It's kind of the gold standard, but I'd recommend Mind Over Mood. It's a book written by psychologists. It's a workbook for clinicians and just regular people. And that's really good mind over mood. I really like the app San Velo if you're in the US. So S A N V E L L O. And then to get kind of that um, similar premise in the Canadian version, it's called Mind Shift. It's made by Anxiety Canada. And anxiety and depression often go hand in hand. This is a little bit different because it's geared towards anxiety, but it's all CBT based. And so that cognitive behavioral therapy basically states that our thoughts, so what we think about, what we say to ourselves, influences how we feel. So lack of motivation, um, low self confidence, isolation, um, down, heavy, overwhelmed, depression depressed, sad, all of those things. So thoughts, feelings, and our behaviors are all interconnected. So if I'm talking that way to myself, if I'm feeling that way physically in my body and emotionally feeling heavy, feeling sad, then I'm probably going to isolate. I'm probably going to withdraw from doing activities that I used to enjoy and going out or people, which is just going to perpetuate that negative thought spiral of, oh, I can't do this. No one wants to see me. Um, I'm better off alone. Uh, it's helpless. Uh, I'm hopeless. What's the point? All of those negative types of thoughts that feel depression. And then it just propels those feelings too of just feeling heavy and exhausted because you're fighting off those, you know, it's exhausting. You're fighting off those feelings off of those thoughts, all, all of that. And um, yeah, it just perpetuates all of it. So it's how our thoughts, our feelings and our behaviors, what we do or what we don't do are all interconnected. So those are some big ones that I, I, I'm just going to put over here and say, those are, you know, what people go to when they think of depression are or therapy and medication, but I'm going to give you some three other tips too, um, because I think those are go-to. I think they're absolutely uh, really, really good, but I'm also going to talk on a few from the real depression project. This is a really good resource. You can follow them on Instagram and different things. So I'm going to pull that up now and kind of go through some of these because they have a few. And I think I maybe added a bonus one. So you might get four tips and compared to what everyone else shared today, we've got lots of tips. So this is good. And again, not to get overwhelmed because often when we get overwhelmed and we don't know what to do, we just don't do anything. And I don't want that for you. I want you to pick maybe one, maybe two that you really resonate with from the chat box or from what I'm, you know, sharing about, or from this post, write them down and practice them this week and maybe next. And so again, you don't have to do all of them. Just pick one or two that fits well in your life. So if you can see some of these um, slides, it's from the Real Depression Project. Really, really great resource. So treating depression isn't just medication and therapy. So we talked on that. I think they're really valuable. I think they have their place, but it's also learning to forgive yourself and stop shaming yourself learning to forgive yourself and stop shaming yourself. So unforgiveness, resentment, bitterness, this is often really harbored in our body. It's really, it can perpetuate depression and shame. I think shame is one of the worst feelings to experience. And we, it's a core emotion. We all do. And shame is, I am bad. Guilt says I did something bad, which if we're thinking that way or feeling those emotions, we're probably going to feel depressed because they're not really great uplifting ones, but shame is at my core. I'm unworthy. I am bad. And so learning to forgive yourself and stop shaming yourself to help with depression, it might look like forgiving yourself for mistakes and stop shaming yourself. So it could say, you know, everybody makes mistakes. It's okay. I'm learning. Um, I like to say, I'm not good at that dot, dot, dot yet. 
because often we say again that CBT, our negative thought would be, oh, I'm just not good at public speaking. And then I would feel low, lacking self-confidence. I would feel probably overwhelmed, sad. And then my behavior would not to public speak. I wouldn't try to speak up in even small settings. And so it would just perpetuate that cycle of my negative thought. I'm not good at public speaking. And I would just, you know, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, but I could say instead, I'm learning how to put myself out there more. I'm learning some specific things to say in meetings. I'm growing in public speaking. Or even if you can't say more of those more positive style or growing phrases, like I'm growing in public speaking, it's I'm not good at public speaking dot, dot, dot yet. I'm not that good at it yet. And so that can be a way to just even change that and also stop for stop shaming yourself and, and learn to forgive yourself for what you did in survival mode. Oftentimes what we did um, withdraw or sleep helped us in a, in a moment where we, it was just all too overwhelming. We had to just survive and maybe it served a purpose then, but it doesn't now. And also for not making the right call on something in the past that you know now know was wrong, thanks to the benefit of hindsight, because hindsight's 2020. So it could be a toxic relationship. We see that a lot of, you know, how did I let this happen? How did I get here? Or with depression too, or an injury, or uh, a relationship with food or exercise of how did I get here? Um, and often it's it's not you woke up that way and it happened, it's small things over time. So it's just learning to be really kind, forgive yourself. Okay. Another number two could be practicing self-care. So practicing self-care that could be sleeping. That could be just improving sleep hygiene. So that's kind of a funny word, but what we use in psychology in terms of what sleep hygiene means, you can Google it. I really like anxiety, Canada sleep hygiene as a resource, but there's so many resources out there on it, but basically it's not just a bedtime routine for kids. You know, when you're little and as a mom, I try to, you know, if they have a bath and a story, maybe a song, maybe a rock, um, you know, get your pajamas on, uh, turn the lights low, like maybe just have the lamp, or if you have a diffuser, things like that. So you kind of set the mood, you set the tone. There's a routine, which someone said earlier, Hey, a morning routine can really help with depression to get going. Absolutely. Cause often it's hard to get going in the morning. The same is true for the evening though, because sleep is a big one with when we're feeling depressed or distressed is really with anxiety. It's often, um, difficulty sleeping. So you might be able to fall asleep, but can't stay asleep. So it's intermittent. You're up and you're off. You're up and you're, you can't shut off your brain with depression. You can either oversleep or undersleep. Maybe you're waking up at like 3 AM and you just can't sleep, or maybe you're oversleeping for like 12 hours and you're just so wiped. And so sleep hygiene could be making an adult bedtime routine and a wind down routine that could look like, you know, reading um, for 20 minutes before bed instead of being on your phone and watching TV because it activates parts of the brain and it's really hard to shut off. It could be a self, you know, self soothing bath or a shower that's warm, like that sensation again, and, and getting your brain to start to be grounded or having some tea. Um, could be journaling, like writing three things that you were grateful for that day. Cause it's amazing what gratitude does again with the chemicals that shift in our brain, but our perspective then of just ending on that good day of, oh, these were three positive things or three things I was grateful for. So that can be something really great. Um, it could also look like checking in on yourself mentally and emotionally each day to reflect on what you need and then following through with it. So it could be, okay, what did I do today that I'm really proud of myself for? What am I grateful for? What did I learn today? How was I kind? Those specific words I like to use because they really show what your values are. And then it could be putting in boundaries. We talked about boundaries last time. If you missed it, you can go back and watch our boundaries talk. But often when the boundaries crossed, that can lead to, to sadness, to anger, to anything. But putting in boundaries will really help against depression, especially when you're at the risk of burnout, which we're seeing a high, high turnout about. And then number three, 
finally, challenging negative beliefs and thoughts about yourself. So this is really the core of CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy. But I often think you have to do some of the breathing, some of the grounding of the body before you can go to the mind. Because if you try to go right to the mind, some of us are just too overwhelmed and it it just won't work or get it out on a, a blank piece of paper to kind of just free up some mental real estate. So it could look like being open minded to other ways of perceiving yourself and life because thoughts aren't facts. Um, I like to say thoughts are real, but they're not always reality. And so even just saying, is that a hundred percent true? can be huge. Um, It could be exploring evidence against your beliefs, like I'm a failure and not surrendering to the impulse to dismiss them. So what I like to do is do this evidence for evidence against, like I, I try to help people identify that negative thought that's, you know, feeling that negative feeling and those negative behaviors that lead to depression and perpetuate it. And if we could get at that thought pattern, then we can kind of put it on trial and see, okay, would this really stand up with a jury? and a court and all of that, like, what is there enough evidence for this negative belief to be true? Let's write out all the reasons I believe it. And then we go, okay, what are some other, you know, perspectives? What are some reasons that maybe it's not a hundred percent true? And we do that. And that's a really, really great strategy. And again, finally exploring past evidence for your beliefs and reframing them. So again, someone said earlier reframing, So that could look like maybe I wasn't bullied because I'm a loser, but because they were insecure and needed to bring others down to feel bigger. And I really like some of those. We'll go to maybe a a bonus one here in a minute. I'm just going to pop over to the chat and see what y'all are saying. And if you have any questions, I want to invite them now or anything else you'd add. But um, those are some things that I would really suggest. So learning to forgive and not shame. Um, It could be just practicing self-care and self-care is not just bubble baths and candles and things like that, but it could just be actively reflecting journaling that sleep hygiene. Cause sleep is a big one. Um, it could just be incorporating exercise there or scheduling in time with a safe friend. It could be therapy like that self-care. Those are, those are aspects of it. And then that negative beliefs challenge them reframing them. So that's really the kind of the meat and potatoes of cognitive behavioral therapy way that evidence for evidence against. All right. So what are y'all saying? So Adam, what do we do when we are stuck, not getting better, even though we are doing therapy and taking medications? So, I mean, two things there. One, ask yourself, is this the right type of therapy for me? Is this the right fit with my therapist? We actually know in our psychology research that these strategies are great, but the most effective outcome, if we know therapy is most successful with someone that you feel connected with, it's called the therapeutic relationship or rapport. And so when you have a strong therapeutic rapport connection with your therapist, that's really the out that shows us that it's probably more likely to be a successful outcome of therapy rather than, oh, well, it's, a th- you know, all therapists are the same. And this one does cognitive behavioral therapy. This one does narrative therapy or somatic therapy. Like it might be a strategy approach, but it might be the fit approach that you need to change. Um, and same with medication. Every medication works different with every body because your body's unique. And so having those conversations with your doctor, it's not rare um, for people to try two, three I've, I've seen people try quite a number of different types of medications at times, if that's the road that you, you feel like you need to go. So I would say seeing the therapeutic approach, is it the right approach for you? Is it the right therapist fit for you? Is it the right medication for you? And then maybe trying some of these other things as well. But if it's around therapy and medication, those are my go-to, but that's a really good question. Um, Michelle, this is day number one for me. My J my journal just came. Yes. So our self-love journal is really great. Our self-talk journal is coming out. Um, that's the one I wrote. It's all cognitive behavioral therapy based on changing these negative self-talks and, and these beliefs. And yeah, so I'm so glad that's awesome. Um, oh, Lisa, two things recommend a specific journal. I feel like I don't realize how mentally spent burnt out I am before it's too late. How to prevent that? Um, okay. Yes. I'm not, I don't know. Please, Lisa, correct me if I'm not understanding correctly. Are you asking me to recommend a specific journal? 
I would say probably the self-love or the self-talk one. Um, if it's more confidence based, which is often really linked with depression, I really like this, the self-confidence workbook. It's a CBT workbook. If you haven't known, I really like CBT. I like a lot of approaches and I, none of us are purists as therapists. We incorporate quite a bit. Um, Oh, and, and thank you. Our therapy talks just put in our product stuff of the self-love journal. That's really good. So yeah, I think that it could be a bullet journal. I know some people who don't really like journaling, but it's like, I just want to get some things out the bullet journal, the five minute a day journal, the one line or, or the five year journal. So you write like one line a day, basically, and you get to see that progress over the last five years. Um, I've done that. And I really like that. Actually, that's a really cool one. Um, the gratitude journal there's, if you go to, you know, Barnes and Noble, if you're in the U S or Indigo in, in Canada, or just even on Amazon, you'll find a lot of those, but I like, I really like our self-love one. I really like the self-talk one because again, the evidence-based practice, it's, you know, that it's coming from research, um, and real therapists. So that's really good. Awesome. Good, good. I hope you like those. You could check those out on the website and, and, um, yeah. Okay. Do you have a third screen for that third one? Um, yes, our, our tech can put that up. Oh, perfect. Good. Okay. It was up. awesome. Good. Good. How about any other questions on, or anything else you'd add to this? Um, and then I'll give you a bonus one too. Of, so again, we have from the Real Depression Project, check them out. Great resources, um, learning to forgive yourself, stop shaming yourself. What does that kind of look like too? And I kind of spoke on that. Practic practicing self-care. So that could be sleep hygiene. That's a really big one. That's one we really highlighted because with depression, we often see that because it's really this lack of motivation and exhaustion physically, emotionally, mentally. And then three, challenging the negative beliefs and thoughts about yourself. So this is really reminding yourself of your past successes, you know, challenging the evidence for evidence against of that negative thought, even just being open-minded. Like I like to just ask myself, is it a hundred percent true? A hundred percent. And even that kind of takes the pressure off of all or nothing. Like I'm, you know, I can do this or I can't, um, I should exercise or I'll never do it or, you know, those sort of things. So that hundred percent kind of takes it down. And then for a bonus one, I'm sure you won't be very shocked by this because we've talked a lot about this, but learning and practicing new ways to regulate your emotions. So this goes back to Adam's point of what if I've tried therapy? What if I tried medication and I just still feel stuck? So I want to give you permission to try new ways. Like research is always growing and you are unique to you. Like there are specific strategies and approaches that we think as healthcare professionals that work really well, but you are you and you're the only you out there. So we, our job is to work with you to personalize it, to find, okay, in your real life, what are some things that work? Like number, you know, one on, on this is mindfulness. Maybe you don't like mindfulness. Like I have people that I recommend that to, and they're like, no way. And I'm like, that's totally cool that's for you. Let's explore something else. Like we have a lot of tools to go with in building a house, a hammer, a screwdriver, nails, you know, saws, all sorts of stuff. We don't just use one. We use a lot. And that's the same thing for you. So it could be exercise. And I really love exercise. There was a study out from Harvard a few years ago that showed that um, high intensity interval training. So HIT exercise was more effective in treating depression than anti-depression medication. So there's a lot of differing things that are coming up. Like we're constantly researching and trying to better this field because so many people experience this and we want to help. Um, so exercise is a huge, huge one. Um, getting a cathartic release. Okay. What does that mean? So my husband works in natural health. I'm all about this. Um, because again, I'm a former athlete and coach the mind body connection is so real, but it could be, um, you know, painting in a way that you move your body or something just feels feels released with your body. It could be walking in nature. It could be journaling. It's like very freeing and creative. Art is huge in this one. Um, so again, it could be painting, but it, it doesn't have to be 
coloring. It could be pottery. It could be refurbishing furniture. It could be redecorating. It could be journaling, but having a specific journal, like maybe just a blank page is too overwhelming. So it's this really creative outlet um, that incorporates, you know, your mind, but also the creative aspect of you. And I would even add more of the body as well. So it could be, you know, exploring a new um, trail in a hike or going to a new town to explore. Like there's a lot of things that can add to this um, creative outlet or to tap into that to help get unstuck too. And again, I think going and, and researching some of these uh, places where you can find them like Instagram or Real Depression Project, our self-love journal, um, the podcast, Therapy Talks podcast, these lives to say, okay, where, what can I find one thing here? And I'm all about the practical, try to pick one of one or two of these things that we talked about today, write them down. There's so much power in writing them down, like put them in your phone or a sticky note where the visual you're going to see it and try to practice it this week. And, and really write that down, reflect on that. Hey, where did I try to exercise and not to shame yourself, not to beat yourself up, but to say, well, I'm learning, I'm growing in this. I, I see two slots in my week that I can incorporate this. Well, I'm going to put them in. I'm going to put it in my calendar. Like I would an appointment. And I think that's where we start to gain some traction and it will take a little bit of time. It's not going to change overnight, but in a week or two, you're going to see a noticeable difference if you do that and talk with a friend, like it, it adds some accountability to your life. Even the, the power of sharing it or saying it, writing it out can be enough to make you feel like, okay, I'm going to do it. Um, Natalie, how do we deal with feeling like there is no point in getting better anymore? Well, I think just touching on what I, what I shared about therapy, you know, the right fit with your therapist, the right approach, the right medication, and then these various different learning practice, practicing new strategies, that bonus point, um, start there, pick one or two of these that we talked about and do it. And if you're in, if you're not in therapy, I highly recommend that. Obviously I'm a therapist, so I'm going to say that, but I think everybody can benefit from therapy at, at some point in their life or with safe people, like identify your safe people. And um, maybe if you're someone who works really well with books, like reading something like Brene Brown, um, or one of the, if you're more into the journaling aspect, utilize one of our journals, um, or some of the other journals I mentioned, there's lots of good stuff out there. So I just want to encourage you. Um, it may feel like you're alone, but the fact is you're not alone. There are a lot of strategies and personalize them for you. Um, and Michelle has said, I've, I've been there recently too. And, and then she went on to bravely, bravely say, I reached out to my doctors, my therapists, and anybody else I could think of over the weekend. So good job, Michelle. And that seems pretty recent. And I think that's, you know, that's what we're here for as professionals, but also as family, like what we do too, you can't always access them, you know, 24 seven. So, okay. Who are your safe people? Like maybe write a list of them and who, who are they? Are, are they friends? Are they family? Um, and try to let them in a little bit. It's a, it's so amazing. Just even with safe people, not everybody just to share how you're really doing. And I would really encourage that because we often feel like we're isolated, we're alone, but going back to earlier when I asked, okay, what are some of your strategies? Someone earlier said, you know, get sharing, uh, camaraderie, taking my eyes off myself and helping someone else. It's huge, absolutely huge. And maybe that is it. Maybe you feel like, oh, I don't know if I have a safe person. So definitely get into counseling. Um, maybe you volunteer somewhere, like serve at a homeless shelter, serve meals, that sort of thing. Like getting our eyes off of ourselves and helping someone else really is so powerful too, if, if that's kind of connecting with you. But I, I really commend you, Michelle, for reaching out and sharing that because you did not have to share that. But that was just really encouraging, not only to whoever had that question, but probably to most of us, too. And whoever's going to, you know, watch this or reread re this. And I just want to encourage you. That takes a lot of bravery. And thank you. And I would just to I'm going to welcome any questions here now and a big closing point, you know, we have some of those practical tips we talked way more than three, but again just pick one or two that really resonate with you write them down, but number one show up. I think there's so much power in showing up and really celebrating that you're showing up 
not dismissing it, not saying, well, everybody else does, or I had to, or it's not that big of a deal, but saying, no, I showed up. I listened to this talk. I'm going to get this book, or I'm going to try this one thing. I'm going to try meditation. I'm going to try exercise this week. Hey, I showed up to listen and learn about this. I'm proud of myself. There is so much power in showing up. So if you feel stuck, show up. Every journey starts with one step, but you got to show up for that. And so I really encourage you that. And I thank you all for showing up today and sharing. You are so interactive. It's so fun. Um, you really are. You're, you're gifting to other people who are going to listen to this and, and read it and these tips because it's real. It's real life and it has to fit into our real life. And it loses power, depression, anything negative or uncomfortable or distressing loses power when we share about it in a safe space. So thank you. And I'm really honored that we could have that space. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, one of, one of the last questions coming in is what's the number one thing we can do when we're having a bad anxiety or depression day? I would say reach out to someone because that's usually our tendency is to withdraw. But again, it's so personal and it's so unique to you. Pick one of the earlier strategies that some of our um, everyone in here shared about. Pick one of the strategies that I talked about or the Real Depression Project slides. It's so personal. And so I would say pick one, like pick one that actually is going to fit into your real life. Cause if you're, if there's an emotional connection to it, you're going to do it. If, um, a physician or a therapist tells you, Hey, just do this one thing. There's no emotional connection to you. So the likelihood of your follow through and motivation, and this is more productivity and performance research. Cause I work in sports psychology. You're not going to do it. And so for you to actually do it, there has to be some skin in the game. There has to be an emotional connection. So maybe that is just rereading through the chat box. Maybe that's re-looking at these slides or re-listening to this and just saying, okay, my focus of this is when I have a bad day, this is the one thing I'm going to try next time. Put it in your phone. So wherever you are, if you're at work or you're driving, um, you're out with friends, you have access to it. It's not at home in a journal locked away you have access to that one thing you're going to try. And then you feel more supported. You feel like you have a tool in your toolbox. You're kind of armored up. You would never go into battle without wearing armor. Well, this is you preparing and this is really brave. And so that could be something to try is pick one thing from today that resonates with you, write it out, keep it in your phone somewhere that's accessible and then practice it. And it may not do the trick the first time, but keep practicing it. Cause like any skill, we have to build that muscle. Um, and the most important thing seems to be not being afraid to try new things and be able to use resources that are available for us. Totally like that ending bonus point. That's why I picked that one is it's learning new things. It's trying new things. If we always did what we've always done up to this point, we're just going to keep getting what we always got. So we've got to try some new things sometimes. So, and, and I know it's scary. It's so much easier said than done. And that's why I think being with safe people, whether that's friends, family, a therapist, can be really, really encouraging because I don't think I would do it on my own <laughs> and, and we need people. We're created for connection. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Betsy, for coming on. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you for this. Thank you for coming on and sharing your story. And I would just keep encouraging you all, you know, keep sharing your story, keep showing up and, and thank you.